cover page. Thank yeah, you. so the title of the talk is Divisions in the Core of Global Capitalism, Italian Labor and Free Trade. So thanks a lot, first of all, for, for coming. I've talked recently to activists who are involved in resisting these kind of free trade agreements. And they've said it's actually, they find it very difficult to generate interest amongst civil society organizations at this point in time. Because of course, with the war in Ukraine, with the war in, on, on Gaza, the war in Israel, Palestine, there are so many other more urgent matters people focus on. And it's quite difficult actually to uh, get people to focus on questions of free trade. But one of the things I want to do in this talk is also to demonstrate a bit why it is actually quite important to think about free trade and the implications uh, of free trade. So by way of introduction, why do I think it's important to look at free trade? And I think there are three particular reasons. First of all, free trade is at the heart of global capitalism for three uh, precise reasons. First, it organizes the worldwide sale of commodities for profit making, very basic, but that's the, the, the very key of the free trade regime. Second, however, it also underpins global value chains. Yeah, in a lot of industrial sectors, more and more of production is organized across borders, but that can actually only function if these parts can flow freely to and fro unhindered across borders. And we've seen that in the pandemic when there was a stoppage to free trade in many parts of the world, how difficult it suddenly became to maintain these production across borders, these transnational production networks, these global value chains. So free trade is absolutely essential also to the way of how goods, commodities are being produced uh, at the global level. And finally, I think it's important to remember that since the mid 1990s, we have this expanded free trade regime. So it's no longer just about the uh, trading in goods across borders, but the whole free trade, and I consciously put it in inverted commas, the whole free trade regime has actually expanded into all kinds of other areas. So there are intellectual property rights, there are uh, trade-related investment measures, trade has been expanded into the sphere of services, it has been expanded in, into agriculture, and of course, most infamously, there have been these investor-state dispute settlement mechanisms, which allow corporations to sue particular countries when they think that a change in national policy making infringes their future, their expected future profits. And so we can see how free trade, because of that expanded free trade regime, is affecting more and more parts of various national economies and people's uh, direct daily lives. Now, free trade has been for some time, a problem for the global labor movement. And there was a division, there has been a division between trade unions in the global north. We see that also in Europe, who generally, which generally support free trade because they say, well, by expanding markets for the products of our, inverted commas, corporations, the employment of our members in these corporations is secured. Therefore, these trade unions support free trade. Trade unions in the global south, however, they point out that very often these agreements have tended to result in deindustrialization of their particular countries, and therefore they oppose these agreements. And social movements in the south and global north have tended to support global south trade unions in there. So there's a split in the global labor movement. And so there's a question, of course, how can we generate links of transnational solidarity in such a situation? In this paper, I want to focus on the positions of the Italian labor movements, questioning whether perhaps it's not any longer only a split 
in the division of the global labor movement, perhaps. Also in Europe, actually, we are now experiencing such a division between labor movements in support of free trade and opposed to free trade. And particularly when analyzing the position of Italian labor movements, I'm going to look at the comprehensive economic trade agreement between the European Union and Canada, as well as between the currently negotiated agreement between the European Union and Mercosur countries. Now, by way of first sections, by way of inter-free trade, I first want to reflect on a few conceptual issues. And I start off with a critical political economy perspective. Lots of people refer to critical political economy perspectives. Personally, I think it only makes sense if we link that to a historical materialist perspective. So in what follows, I'm going to introduce a Marxist perspective on free trade agreements. Now, first of all, when we look at free trade from a Marxist perspective, I think it makes sense to remind ourselves about key capitalist structuring conditions. Capitalism, because of the way of how production is organized around wage labor and the private ownership or control of the means of production, is enormously dynamic. Employers have to compete with each other for market share. But in doing so, it's also crisis prone. Yeah, because whenever an employer, whenever a particular capitalist moves ahead, gaining new market share by introducing new technology and therefore being able to produce more cheaply, better and more goods. Of course, the other capitalists through competition are compelled to catch up and overtake that particular first mover capitalism. So there's this constant competition which makes capitalism very dynamic, but of course it also makes it crisis prone, resulting in regular crises of overproduction in crisis of overaccumulation. More and more goods are being produced, but they are not enough people who can actually afford them. Yeah, so more is produced as a surplus of capital, which can be no longer combined with a surplus of labor. And it's in those moments that capitalism enters a crisis condition. Now, these regular crises don't mean that capitalism collapses. There are always a number of counter strategies available to capitalism of how to overcome these crises. But as the third structuring condition, we have this relentless pressure of outward expansion to overcome crises, resulting in uneven and combined development. And I would argue that this is where these trade negotiations come in, yeah? because in the current crisis of overaccumulation, where there's lots of private cash sloshing around in the system, desperately looking for profitable investment opportunities, it's precisely in this moment of crisis that there is this renewed push for concluding the CETA and EU Mercosur free trade agreements. And especially, for example, if you look at the EU Mercosur agreement, it's no surprise that it is European car manufacturing companies as well as chemical companies such as uh, uh, Bio or BASF who are heavily lobbying for the conclusion of these agreements. So in a way, the current push on Europe on these free trade agreements is directly related to the crisis of overaccumulation and the need to expand outward uh, in order to overcome and beat only temporarily these crises. And that, of course, also indicates to us why different national labor movements find themselves in rather different locations within the global political economy. Uh, because in the North, the is a tendency of support for this outward expansion for those free trade agreements, whereas labor movements in the global south are generally on the receiving side, on the 
dealing with the negative outfall of the fallout of these uh, trade agreements and hence these north-south divisions. And finally, I would argue that labor movement agency needs to be understood within these structuring conditions of capitalist social relations. So towards the end of my presentation, I will be looking at the way of how the Italian production structures have been integrated into global production structures in order to try to make sense of the particular positions of these Italian labor movements. Before I get to that, however, I think it's not enough coming from a Marxist perspective just to look at the kind of dynamics and pressures around the production of commodities around the workplace. Because what we increasingly have also been reminded to is that when we look at capitalist accumulation, it just it doesn't just depend on the creation of surplus value in production, but it also uh, depends on the expropriation of unpaid labor in the sphere of social reproduction. And here, especially feminist Marxists have uh, reminded us of this close connection. So capitalist outward expansion is not just occurring within production, but there's always the constant pressure to expand the expropriation of unpaid labor in the sphere of social reproduction. Equally, capitalism is not just focusing on exploitation in the sphere of production, but capitalism has always also been racial capitalism. So historically, of course, the Atlantic slave trade is very key to the emergence of capitalism, as is the use of cotton and sugar, for example, produced on slave plantations in the colonies, which underpinned capitalist further development within the core. And of course, today too, capitalism continues to depend on expropriating unfree labor, continuing this kind of racial forms of oppression from the historical past. So capitalism is also always racial capitalism, and those dynamics need to be kept in mind. And thirdly, we need to remember that capitalist, capitalist uh, accumulation also always depends on the relentless search for new cheap natures. Water is one of those uh, key areas in this respect. Yeah, for example, the extractivist industry constantly depends on the use of, of uh, basically free water in its uh, uh, doings. And so it is uh, uh, Jason Moore who has pointed out how capitalism constantly expands into, into nature, appropriating, expropriating these cheap natures in the continuation of ever more intensified and higher levels of capitalist accumulation. And if we keep that in mind, if we keep in mind an expanded understanding of capitalist accumulation, then that results in two conceptual consequences, I would argue. And we will see that when we look empirically at the Italian labor movements. First of all, labor movements need to be more broadly defined, including not just trade unions, but equally also social movement, environmental groups, citizen committees, and farmers' organizations. Yeah, so when we think about labor movements, we have to think much more broadly than simply the organized working class. And secondly, equally, when we think about class struggle, it's not just the kind of struggles at the workplace over wages, over pensions, over working conditions, but it's also the struggles in the sphere of social reproduction, the struggle for water, for example, the struggle for access to education, the struggle for access to healthcare, which are equally moments of class struggle. Or if you think about movements such as the Black Lives Matter movement or movements against the uh, destruction of nature, these moments should also, I would argue, 
be understood as moments of class struggle. And so we need to have a much broader view of what it means to be a labor movement and a much broader view of what is referred to as class struggle taking into account an expanded understanding of capitalist accumulation. Okay, and on the basis of this kind of understanding, the next question is then, how can we understand free trade from a Marxist, from a historical materialist perspective? Now, here I would argue the notion of unequal exchange is very essential. But before coming to that, first let's remember liberal free trade theory and of course there have been many developments in this area but ultimately liberal free trade theory still goes back to the work of david ricardo in 1870 and he basically argued that well countries should always focus on producing what they are best at and trade for everything else And inevitably, that would result in everyone being better off. And he made the the, the examples of of Britain and Portugal. But on that fundamental understanding, the further liberal development continues to today that basically we should completely deregulate the global economy, allow countries and corporations to focus on what they are best at producing, and then that would facilitate them to uh, trade for all the other things they need. And at the end, the countries, its citizens, but also the global economy in general would be best off by doing so. Empirically, however, that has been demonstrated not to be the case. There's a study by the British NGO Warn Wand in 2009, which demonstrates quite well that actually this opening up of economies, this focus on deregulation and liberalization, this focus on this free trade agreement actually results in a deindustrialization of peripheral countries. This is precisely the reason for why labor movements in the global south have been so vividly opposed to free trade agreements. And it's not just these studies, it's it's quite well documented how free trade agreements have resulted in the deindustrialization of peripheral countries. So really from a Marxist position, we need to understand this relentless push for free trade as part of capital's attempts to counter the crisis tendencies which afflict capitalism. Yeah. Expanding free trade is one way of trying to secure new markets in order to stave off crises. And here in particular, that's where the notion of unequal exchange comes in. When we look at the trade between countries with a higher organic composition of capital, i.e. where the production of commodities is paid of larger level of constant capital, and here especially the latest technologies, if those goods are traded in process of international trade with uh, commodities from countries with a lower organic composition of capital, i.e. more producing more labor intensive goods with lower levels of capital, then we are in a situation where because of the higher levels of technology being part of those good produced in the capitalist core being produced in the global north and they being exchanged for goods with lower levels of technology but more labor intensive uh, uh, goods then we have to because at the international level there's an equalization of the profit rates we have a situation where surplus value created in the global south is being siphoned off to countries in the global north. What does that then imply? And this is where the work of Marini comes in and you see a a, a cover, you see a photo of the cover of the book edited by Amanda Latimer of Marini's uh, uh, key works. This is where then what does capital then, what are the options left to capital in the periphery 
in order to make up for that lost surplus value, which has been shifted to the global north. Well, the only way they can then respond to it is by increasing the exploitation of their own workers. And this results then in conditions of super exploitation in the periphery, where wages are pushed below the value of labor, below what is necessary for workers to reconstitute themselves. So this is where we have then these conditions of super exploitation within the periphery, resulting from the way of how free trade is underpinned by an equal exchange. Okay, let's now have a look more closely at the kind of expanded free trade agreements. And here in particular, CETA and the EU Mercosur free trade agreements. Now, CETA was signed in 2016 and has been provisionally applied in the global economy since 2017 but it has still not been fully ratified. And the main uh, problems associated with uh, uh, CETA include that the, the investor state disputes settlement mechanisms. It includes the fact that CETA provides a backdoor for, yes, for US corporations to enter the European market because they have their own free trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. But it also implies the problem of the trade in agricultural products, which are based on lower levels of regulations than in the European Union. And therefore, especially European agricultural products are under heavy pressure as a result of the CETA free trade agreement. This is one of the uh, agreements I'm going to look at when thinking about the position of Italian labor movements. The second set of free trade agreements is the EU uh, Mercosur agreement. And we've recently heard here from Bettina Müller from the German uh, organization PowerShift, which tries to mobilize resistance against this agreement being concluded, highlighting the problems with the EU Mercosur trade agreement. It was agreed in principle in 2019, but still has not been completed. And it's especially at the moment that there are lots of negotiations going on, trying to, to complete these negotiations. What are the problems with it? Well, the way of how it is supposed to work is that there will be an increase in exports in beef, soy, and ethanol from the Mercosur countries including Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay, in exchange for cars, car parts, and chemical products from the European Union. Now, why is that problematic? Well, first of all, it's problematic because increase in beef, soy, and ethanol underpins, first of all, their deforestation in the Amazon and parts of Argentina, increase in free trade, of course, also fuels climate change. And increase in free trade along these lines results in a deindustrialization in the Mercosur countries. Exports estimate that if that agreement comes into play, comes into force, there will be the loss of more than 180,000 jobs within uh, manufacturing in Mercosur countries. And of course, why does that happen? Well, it happens because this is precisely an example of unequal exchange in the global economy. Because the trading of cars and car parts and chemical products, which are based on much higher levels of technology, on much higher levels of constant capital, in exchange for primary commodities such as beef, soy, and ethanol. This, of course, constitutes precisely this moment of unequal exchange where products based on high levels of the organic composition of capital in exchange for low levels of organic composition of capital result in the siphoning off 
of surplus value created in Mercosur being shifted to European countries. So very clearly, we can see the problems already of those two trade agreements, part of the expanded free trade regime within the global political economy. Now, what does that, then how do Italian labor movements defined in a broad way, how do they respond to this free trade agreements? And already when it came to contesting the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, which the European Union and the United States tried unsuccessfully to conclude in the mid uh, uh, 2010s, already back then, in Italy, we had the establishment of a broad alliance of trade unions, environmental groups, farmer organizations, social movements, citizens committees, as well as the trade observatory Fairwatch as the coordinating point, participating in the European-wide resistance of this TTIP free trade agreement. And it's this alliance which also underpins the current resistance against CETA, the current resistance against the conclusion of the EU Mercosur free trade agreement. Now, who are the, the parts, who are the labor movements participating in this alliance? Well, first of all, there are environmental groups. And one example is here, the Fridays for Futures, Italia. Here, the main criticism is the impact on climate change resulting from the EU Mercosur Free Trade Agreement, as, for example, exemplified in increasing levels of deforestation. In addition to environmental groups in Italy, we also have farmer organizations which are part of this large alliance. Coldiretti, for example, is an Italian organization which brings together small farmers in Italy. And they bemoan especially the threat to make in Italy products because the deregulation would imply that suddenly products such as uh, Parma ham or Parmigiano are no longer protected, protected quality products, but could be undercut by cheaper equivalents from the global south, from Mercosur countries. They criticize, Coldiretti criticizes the importation of grain and meat based on growth hormones, GMOs and pesticides, which are forbidden in the European Union, while they are uh, freely available in the global south. And in general, they criticize these free trade agreements, CETA and the EU Mercosur negotiations, for being a threat to small scale farming in Europe. So we have environmental groups opposed, but we also have farmers' organizations being opposed in Italy to these free trade agreements. Other actors include, amongst others, Attack Italia, and they point out that really what needs to be at the forefront of trade agreements would be social rights, labor rights, and the environment. And they must have priority over the freedom of capital movements and transnational corporations. But of course, those free trade agreements, CETA and EU Mercosur, they have side chapters on trade and sustainable development, but there are no enforcement mechanisms ensuring that these rights, social rights, labor rights, protection of the environment are actually secured. And it's this lack of enforceable mechanisms which make social movements such as Attack Italia oppose TTIP, oppose EU Mercosur or the CETA agreements. Of course, there are also the trade unions in Italy which are involved in these organizations against free trade agreements. And most importantly, we have here the CGIL, the formerly communist-related trade union uh, confederation. And they oppose 
the treaties for the investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. They oppose them because there is this lack of enforceable uh, mechanisms when it comes to the protection of social and workers' rights and the environment. They oppose these treaty agreements because they are based on a negative list approach, which means you need to identify the sectors which you want to keep outside the agreements rather than the positive list approach where you have to actually actively identify the sectors which are part of the agreement. And they CGIL opposes uh, these agreements because they facilitate the export of pesticides to Mercosur countries by European chemical giants, pesticides which are prohibited, prohibited within the European Union itself. And so we have an agreement which allows European cooperation to export pesticides to the Mercosur, pesticides which are themselves forbidden for, for their, their application in the European Union. So CGIL, this trade union, clearly opposed. And this position is echoed by some of its key federations. So for example, FLAI, the federation which organizes agricultural workers, very closely mirrors the position, the opposition position by the employers in agriculture, Coldiretti, which I mentioned just before because they are also concerned about the made in Italy products and they are also concerned about workers' rights. Most interesting perhaps is the opposition by FIUM CGIL, FIUM which organizes workers in manufacturing and which perhaps we would expect to be supportive of free trade agreements because that would facilitate the export of manufacturing goods. However, FIUM points out that, hold on a second, there's a lack of transparency. There are problems with the ISDS clauses. There are problems with a lack of enforceable standards. And there are also a problem with environmental uh, uh, destruction resulting from these free trade agreements. The only qualifying comment FIUM CGR makes is that when we do resist these kind of free trade agreements, we need to pay attention to the importance of a just transition. Because workers which are being made redundant in sectors organized by FIUM, because free trade is no longer being applied widely, they of course need to also be offered a viable future with jobs in other uh, sectors, such for example, uh, the, the green economy. As such, however, FIUM is opposed to this expanded free trade agenda as it is reflected in EU Mercosur or the CETA agreements. And finally, there are two other confederations in Italy. There's WIL, which is opposed and to some extent was part of the alliance against these free trade agreements. Here, one of the main criticisms was that the Mercosur trade unions were not really given the space by their countries to be involved in the negotiations. One of the key reasons why you will uh, rejected this free trade agreement. And finally, we have CISL coming from a Catholic tradition. And here, the position is slightly different. So they are not enthusiastic about free trade but they would always emphasize the importance of sitting at the table. And therefore they are not part of the stop TTIP alliance. They are critical of various free trade measures, but they try to negotiate change from the inside. So when we think about this broad alliance against these free trade agreements in Italy, there is substantial participation by trade unions, especially CGIL and its various federations. There's extensive participation by smaller rank and file trade unions, which are also opposed, opposed to free trade. But CISL as such would not be a part of this alliance. 
looking at generally the kind of position of labor movements in Italy, understood more broadly, then one can notice that perhaps unlike other labor movements in the global north, in Italy, labor movements are opposed to these free trade agreements. And the question then is, okay, so if there is this division opening up within the core of global capitalism, with some labor movements actually being opposed rather than supportive of these free trade agreements, then is the question, how can we understand that? Why is this the case with Italy? And this is the moment then when I would reach back to the conceptual reflections made earlier, where I argued that we need to understand the agency of these social class forces within the wider structuring conditions of capitalism. <clears throat> So this is the moment where I think we need to look at the way of how the Italian production structure is integrated within the global political economy. And I'm moving to this now final part of my presentation. <laughs> now, if we look at the Italian production structure, then historically, Industry emerged especially in the northwest around the cities of Genoa, Torino, as well as uh, Milano. This affected especially the chemical industries, steel industries, and car manufacturing. And there was an attempt made to restructure those areas against worldwide economic recession from the late 1970s onwards. But low wage competition from Central and Eastern Europe, especially after the end of the Cold War, and then the global financial crisis led to wide scale deindustrialization of those sectors. Fiat, for example, which used to dominate the production structure in Torino, has only very small parts of this production still in the city. Otherwise, it either closed it down or transferred production to Central and Eastern Europe and other parts in the world. Now, Italy in the, from the late 70s onwards became quite well known for its growth in networked industry around the so-called Third Italy in the Northeast and center of the country. And this affected uh, industries such as textile, clothing, and footwear. <clears throat> and initially, this was actually quite successful because of those networks, rather than moving production abroad to, to cheap labor relations uh, uh, places in the global south, these network structures allowed those industries to grow when everywhere else in Europe, they were on a declining trajectory. However, it was especially the end of the multi-fiber arrangement in 1994, which was then phased in until 2005, which also affected negatively these particular industrial sectors. So overall, uh, people estimate that there have been 400,000 jobs lost in the Northeast and Central Italy, uh, especially from 2005 onwards. Some companies still survive in the global competition, but this is only the case because they are able to subcontract certain parts of their uh, production lines to cheaper labor locations. So Italian companies in the south, for example, in Apulia in Italy, they have close connections with companies uh, in Albania. Of course, there was also some industries in the south of Italy, around uh, Naples, for example. But these two, in view of global competition, increasingly declined. And last week, we had heard uh, from uh, Martina Locorotondo about the problem of touristification 
of the city of uh, Naples. And I would argue this is also partly due to the fact that other industries have significantly declined. So what can a city of Napoli do in such a situation? Well, it can emphasize the development of its tourism sector. Excuse me. But if this is the main way or the only way left of how you can create employment, then you also have the resulting problem of this touristification where more and more space is taken up by tourists at the expense of local people. A further problem was that the way of how the Italian state responded to the industrialization. Because rather than facilitating technological upgrading, it focused on deregulating the labor market, focusing on making labor cheaper and therefore making the Italian economy more productive through this way. But of course, if you focus on cheap labor strategy, you disincentivize the technological upgrade. And ultimately, this focus on cheap labor in the Italian political economy didn't make the Italian companies more competitive because even if you focus on cheap labor, you will never be able to compete with locations such as China and Asia or even locations in Europe such as Bulgaria and Romania. And ultimately, of course, a big problem for the particular Italian sectors when it comes to competitiveness in the global economy was the low wage competition from China. And that, I would argue, results then in, in the conclusion that actually free trade has not been experienced positively in Italy. Yeah, it didn't result in development in Italy. And it's really against this background, I would argue, in this negative experience with free trade, resulting to a considerable extent in deindustrialization in Italy, but we can understand that increasing opposition by Italian labor movements against free trade. Now, by way of conclusion, searching for alternatives, what are then the Positions. What are the proposals these Italian labor movements would make when it comes to free trade? What would be potential alternatives? And what all the various actors emphasize is a focus on the priority of enforceable rights over trade. Yeah, first you need to secure trade, uh, social and workers' rights, and then you can talk about what you should trade. There's an emphasis, especially when it comes in the agricultural sector, on local and regional production structures to be prioritized over transnational production structures. Quite interestingly, I think CGIL, the union which is so heavily involved in this alliance against free trade agreements in Italy, emphasizes that actually some protectionist measures may be necessary in order to sustain local industries within the global political economy. And that's clearly very different from the position of trade unions in other countries in the global north. But these actors also point out that it is actually quite difficult to identify alternatives when export country trade unions are so heavily supportive of free trade. And again and again, my interviewees, they refer to trade unions in Scandinavia, trade unions in Austria, but also trade unions in Germany, all those countries which heavily depend export-led more growth models with exporting manufacturing goods to the global south. So there is this division within the European labor movement over free trade. The compromise at the European Union level at the moment is the emphasis on the importance of trade, combining it with a focus on workers' rights, democracy, and the environment. But of course, while that sounds quite nice, the fact that there are no enforceable rights at the moment makes this quite a difficult way forward. And so at the moment, 
I would argue that at European level, there hasn't been yet a rupture within the labor movement over free trade. But the tensions are increasing. And over time, I would argue, those tensions will result in ever wider disagreements uh, over the importance of trade. And at that moment, I'm stopping. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Andreas. Uh, that was a fantastic talk, very nicely structured uh, and well-timed as well. Uh, we're going to move on to questions uh, now. I'm going to keep the uh, recording going uh, because often the you know we often have uh, really interesting discussions in the Q and A, and that's often helpful for people who uh, watch on YouTube. Uh, so we're going to move over to questions for the time we've got left. Really excellent presentation that. Uh, Andreas, and we've got a couple of questions already in the chat. Uh, but if anyone's got a question, uh, to you know, if we, if we want to turn on your video cameras or, or, or whatever, that would be great. Amanda, I can see you've got a um, uh, your hand up. If you want to go first, uh, do you want to take the ones in the in the chat first, just because they've been hanging on for longer, or up to you? Uh, you go, Amanda, and then we'll move to the chat after that. Okay, okay, so this was really interesting. I'm really glad that you touched, well, to be honest, on both CETA and the Mercosul uh, agreements because I lost track of them, to be honest. The Mercosul one was going on so long um, that, uh, I mean, the last time I looked, it wasn't even clear whether it was going to be concluded. Um, I've got a couple of a couple of questions. One, do you find, so you've been studying trade unions action around free trade agreements for years. Um, and we've obviously turned a couple of corners with the global financial crisis and COVID and the new protectionism and whatnot. Um, are you finding more scope for North South solidarity around these agreements i mean you 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 flagged what are really actually old divisions between like you said like you said export uh manufacturing unions and um uh global south countries that rely on cheap nature cheap labor for their exports but are you finding any kind of silver lining with the downturn in the economy was there any instances of transnational solidarity that were fertile uh, in that setting. Thanks. Uh, do you want to take one at a time, Andreas, or, or should, do you want to get another question? I think for the moment, I'm happy to take one at a time. And then once you start running out of time, perhaps we can take several. Right. So, I mean, that that that's a very good question. Thank, thanks, Amanda, because, um, yeah, so, there was increasing resistance to free trade, even by trade unions in Germany, the UK, TUC, German DGB, when it came to the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the United States, because there, in a way, it was a trade free and expanded regime free trade agreement between uh, uh, countries in the global north. Yeah. And so that's one moment to say, okay, we, we don't want that further because the negative consequences were so clear. Whereas now, when you think about EU Mercosur, there would be still trade unions in Scandinavia, for example, which are heavily supportive of that because they, they realize the export of cars and car manufacturing. I mean, cars actually, that treaty uh, uh, includes that Bettina Müller mentioned that the export of cars uh, based on combustion engines. Yeah? So in, in the EU, these car manufacturers, they emphasize the shift to e-mobility and they try to combine that with increasing the access for the old type of cars to Latin America. And that's uh, qu quite obvious, the exploitative strategy. And I think so trade unions, the changing positions by trade unions, such as FIUM, the manufacturing trade union in Italy, that's encouraging because I think that's increasingly being acknowledged, but that is problematic. But I don't think that's yet a, a uniform position by, by manufacturing positions, uh, manufacturing uh, trade unions 
So there's this big Stop EU Mercosur Alliance. And one thing they try to do is to organize for November a speaker tour by trade unionists from the Global South with trade unionists from Europe in across different European locations to highlight the problems with the trade agreement. And I think that could be one moment where perhaps in moments of struggle, better bond, bonds, more in-depth bonds of solidarity are, are being developed. Yeah. So I think it's a process. I don't think we are yet, there yet, but I think there might be the first signs of a change in position. Because trade unions in the North too increasingly realize that this kind of free trade is increasingly impacting negatively on uh, uh, countries, on societies in Europe. Thank you. Uh, I'll just move to the uh, the chat then. Uh, start off with the first question from Afnan. Uh, looking forward to hearing from a Marxist perspective how there can be North-South class solidarity is a broader question. As somebody with Algerian origins, my great-granddaddy was a civilian was shot dead by Piednos, usually wor working class French, I've heard, need to read into it more. That's just one example. So keen to hear how this solidarity can be reached. Yeah, but very good question. And and solidarity is, is never automatic, you know, between workers. It can always only result in processes of, of class struggle. It's never automatic. Working class solidarity often is counteracted by moments of racism, by, by patriarchal kinds of uh, uh, of of developments, and it's it's, it's difficult it's, it's difficult to to foresee. Yeah, I I would emphasize that these kind of concrete struggles against, for example, the EU Mercosur agreement. Potentially, out of this moment, you can have these kind of uh, relationships of, of solidarity. And, and we see that emerging, but again, it, it's not automatic. It can always only be the result of concrete moments of struggles, of people realizing that they have more in common, actually, than what divides them. Thanks for that, uh, Andreas. Karen, I see you've um, written the, the, the chat, but you've also got your hand up, so I'll I'll leave this for, for you to ask directly. Yes, thank you. Um, I think you, you answered a couple of uh, questions uh, that I had about um, options for building solidarity, and thank you uh, for that. But I did want to bring in the issue of human rights um, in that in many of the countries that are involved in, in this um, these, these proposed changes in the South, um, citizens, farmers in particular, glad to hear the Italian farmers are aware of this, um, are being displaced from their lands. Indigenous people um, from forestry areas uh, quite violently sometimes. Um, and um, how this affects people and, uh, there, I, I think, is unacceptable to most EU citizens. Um, they may not be aware of it, but um, the other issue is I see this as a major end run around EU uh, regulations by U.S. chemical companies and perhaps some European ones as well, uh, that will literally bring poisons into EU homes uh, that would not otherwise be there. Um, and I think that would be also uh, of interest for people to be aware of. Um, you, you have some protections there that have been in place for 20 or 30 years sometimes that will no longer uh, be in effect with all of this food and livestock uh, moving back and forth. And these these strategies for 
uh, industrial agriculture in the U.S. are coming out of favor as consumers understand what's going on. And so these corporations must, must expand. And, you know, this is one way for them to expand into other territories and, again, find other products, uh, product markets. Um, so um, it's not just what's going on between South America and Central America and Europe. It's it's more of a global thing that you mentioned. I, I really appreciate um, your clear explanation of those things because I think they're very critical um, for people understanding that this is not a good idea. Um, you know, there can always be treaties that are actually equitable treaties mm. if you're going to use this resource to build um, wind turbines in Germany uh, have the same factory to build wind turbines in the nation where they're mining the metals. You know, share the pollution, but share the benefits also. And um, the only other question I had was, in your study of Italy, do you see the option for um, green technology as, as something that um, people, uh, workers can massively move into um, during the next, say, 50 years. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. That That's a very good set, set of questions. I'm actually, I just need to connect my computer to a power source before I'm blocked out. So I'll be back in a sec. Okay. Almost there. Okay, excellent. So thanks a lot, uh, Karen, for those for those questions. So first of all, when it comes to indigenous rights, so they stop EU Mercosur Alliance. That's one of their key uh, uh, emphases to to look at the implications for indigenous and especially if, if you think about the expansion of soy be ethanol production to be uh, exported to the european union the result is deforestation but the result is equally the in further encroachment on the territory of indigenous people who are often the ones who are then suffering as a result of that being uh, uh, expropriated and and uh, uh, pushed away from from their traditional territories so indigenous groups are actually part of the resistance when you look at uh, uh, the allies in, in uh, Brazil, for example. And I attended a meeting, it was in July in Brussels, of this stop the eu Mercosur Treaty. And indigenous represent representatives were also present at that meeting. And I think it's important because so you have these meeting points and you have actually representatives of trade unions coming into direct contact with representatives from these indigenous communities. And it's in these moments that also trade unionists in Europe learn about the implications of free trade policies on these indigenous peoples. So these concerns are more to coming more and more to the front and indigenous people themselves are increasingly active in resisting and participating in resisting these free trade agreements. Now, chemicals, that's very important. You, you point to that. And this, this is one of the paradoxes. Yet the chemical industry in Europe is heavily lobbying the Commission and EU policymakers to complete that EU Mercosur free trade agreement. Because this would allow them to export pesticides to Mercosur countries where they are still permitted which at the same time are prohibited in the application in agriculture in Europe. Of course, with increasing agricultural export from Mercosur countries to the EU, 
in return, those pesticides would reach also, again, European consumers. And you rightly point out, point to the United States there, because it's basically part of this industrialized agricultural model of how food is being produced. And inevitably, that leads to lower qualities. And yeah, we may have high uh, levels of regulation and protection in the European Union, but if we increase uh, trade with areas in the world where these levels of regulation are not present, then of course, this will also have negative repercussions for us. And it's no, no wonder that this new generation of expanded free trade agreements focus not just on lowering tariff barriers, but it's actually the increasing focus on non-tariff, so-called non-tariff barriers. And this is health and safety regulations. This is animal welfare regulations, which are targeted with that. So that that's a massive problem. And of course, it's not just Mercosur EU, but that also includes uh, uh, North America and other parts uh, in the world. Now, when it comes to green technology, I think that what happens in Italy is closely related to the kind of green, green European Green Deal, which has been uh, put forward a couple of years ago and is, is still being pushed. Some elements have already been sacrificed against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine and the changing uh, energy strategies uh, resulting from that. Uh, when we think about, so FIOM, this federation of CGIL, which is critical of these expanded free trade agreements, when they argue we are supporting resisting these free trade agreements, but we demand a focus or we ask for a focus on just transition, that's what they refer to. They say, okay, our members may lose jobs in fossil intensive industries, we accept that. But we also want in exchange then possibilities for our members to be able to find employment in more sustainable green development areas such as green technology. Yeah, so that that's quite important. And there's the at the global level, there's the trade union initiative for energy democracy. I think that that that's the name. And that's precisely what they try to do. Yes, we need to move away from fossil fuel industries, but we need to ensure that our members, workers in those areas, where they are presented with an alternative uh, of how they can ensure sustainable lives. And so that that that's very essential green technology. And for Italian trade unions, that's the same as it would be for trade unions in other parts of Europe or the global north. Thank you for that, uh, Andreas. Uh, we've got uh, a few more comments in the chat. Um, you know, people saying that they really enjoyed the talk. It was very accessible, excellent presentation, wonderful presentation. Very complimentary words there. Uh, we've got uh, Af Afnan's left, but he did ask another question. Oh, sorry, uh, did ask another question. So I'm going to read it out. Uh, I've read both Professor Beeler's blog and papers and wondered for a while how to reconcile the Marxist critique of the largely neoliberal EU with what seems to be your anti-Brexit stance. Correct me if I'm wrong. So an anti-Brexit stance uh, by Marxists against Brexit or that would be, be important to 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 have Afnan still in the room with us. I, I think the left in 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 Britain uh, was divided over the position on Brexit. Yeah, there was a left Brexit position which was thinking that Britain out of the EU would provide the space for more socialist alternatives in the United Kingdom. I personally, although I'm not a supporter of the neoliberal EU as such, I've, I was never convinced by this left uh, uh, Brexit uh, position because as a country on its own within the global political economy as it is constituted today, there's very 
little room of maneuver to chart an alternative socialist course and potentially inside the EU, I would argue, as difficult as it may be, the opportunities are still larger. But it would be important to have Afnan still in the room yet yeah, to, to see how exactly she wanted to phrase and direct that question. Uh, Andy, uh, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure this counts as a question, but I hope you don't mind me raising it, which is, I mean, I'm very appreciative of what you're doing, Andres, which is uh, to link in, you know, uh, Capital with uh, Marini's theory with a really sort of concrete analysis of divisions in the labour movement. I think that's extremely productive uh, methodology. Uh, it, my point is about the interpretation of Marini. And it's, I mean, we've got a reading group reading his book, and it's exactly on the point that you're highlighting that we've had quite a lot of discussion, actually, um, which is that um, if you've got uh, sectors which are high organic composition and low organic composition, <clears throat> what Marx's price of production solution basically says is that all capitalists will get the same rate of profit. Uh, I mean, and that's because the prices of the high tech will be higher than the, and the low tech will be lower. Um, which allows them to claim profit against the capital advance. So that's, but if that's what Marini was talking about, then there is no need to compensate for a loss of profit because it's already an equalized profit situation. And that's what people were scratching their heads about, right? And there are really sort of, um, so in other words, differential compositions of capital do not of themselves explain unequal exchange, it would it would seem, right? Unless you understand an unequal exchange in a different way. And it, a lot of it is about what do we understand by the term unequal exchange? And um, in Marx's solution, what you've got is labor in the high tech uh, sectors, if you like, is represented by more exchange value than labor in the low tech sectors. But it's still, there's, there's not really a transfer of value in the sense that all the capitals are making the same rate of profit. So it doesn't quite fit what Marini's uh, pushing us to and um, or leading us to, I should say. And what happened in the, what happened in the discussion is that uh, two possible ways out of this, right? One is the idea of monopoly of the high tech sectors. Mm -hmm. So the high tech sectors can charge even more than, you know, an equal rate of profit price of reduction would be. Um, uh, but the other one, which I think is really Marini's strong card, and he could actually argue his own case better, in fact, is low pay in the uh, in the low organic composition capital sectors. In other words, capitals in those sectors have got a strong incentive to pay lower because they get proportionately more surplus value. And it's a reduced capital investment as well. So in both ways, they increase their rate of profit. So in other words, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that this is this argument needs some teasing out. And, you know, people are looking at it. And I'm, I'm glad that they are. And it's uh, quite a sort of live area of discussion, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, Andy. I'm, I, I think that that's a very good point. And, and I, I accept that I need to work through that uh, in more more detail. And uh, I, I think Marini is absolutely essential here. It's actually quite, quite interesting. I thought that Karkady and, and Roberts actually also look at the kind of uh, unequal exchange that they reject the idea. I, I, I don't agree with the argument of, of uh, super exploitation because they say, oh, it would happen everywhere and therefore it's not characteristics. And I actually thought Amanda in, in in your edited volume, your co-editor, he, he makes a good intervention. Yeah? And he, he says, yeah, there might be super exploitation in the core too, but what's important is where is it characteristic as a key feature of the social formation of capital? And, and in that sense, it's an aberration in the core, often affecting migrant workers, but it's much more systemic within the periphery. Yeah, and, and in that sense, I think it's quite good. But but so it, it's interesting that 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 debate is coming to the fore again uh, uh, on on unequal exchange. And and Andy, thanks thanks for your input there. I fully accept that that needs to be worked out in more detail. Uh, I see Catherine's got your hand up. If you want to ask a question. Yeah, 
Thank you, and thank you for the great presentation. Uh, so you're looking at maybe interactions between different uh, trade unions, and uh, I was wondering if you were also interested in trade unions and M MPs uh, and MEPs, um, because I think it's very interesting that, for example, if you look at France, on Mercosur, the, well, the French Parliamentary Assembly is really against Mercosur, and they're, and they're making the same arguments of some, uh, some of the uh, mm -hmm. trade unions you've mentioned, and they're just against it, and so they would reject it, uh, Macron too. And on the other side, you've got Germany trying to lobby the France, because uh, Germany wants to export its cars to Mercosur, but France doesn't want the pesticides back into French uh, economy, basically. So I think it was just to know if you were looking at those interactions too, because it's not trade unions versus governments, it's actually trade unions versus other trade unions and governments against other governments. So I think, was it Amanda earlier saying that she didn't know what's going on with it, but it's because basically they're not agreeing. <laughs> On what's going, what's going on, right, at the governmental level too. So I think it's quite interesting that it's not, you know, the people versus others. It's actually all a mixture. And actually, they're talking about mirror clause agreements. So that's that would be the idea that if EU farmers have to respect uh, environmental laws, well, the mirror clause would be that the others have to do it too. So they want that in the agreement. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Catherine. I think that that's very important to, to look at the kind of, as I would say, form of state level, yeah, and, and how these struggles play play out there. And in, in that paper, I mainly look at trade unions because I'm interested in labor movements and to what extent they can establish links of uh, transnational solidarity. But this alliance, Stop EU, Mercosur, they they very closely look at the in, at the kind of different country level organization. They look okay with our arguments. Where can we tap in to French parliamentarians or European parliamentarians, policymakers? Yeah, and there are different concerns which are of different importance in different countries. So the cool food quality is of very high importance in France. Yeah, and that 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 can also mean on occasions that you can construct alliances with perhaps parliamentarians of centre right uh, uh, groupings in in the French Parliament. Equally, in Austria, for example, which are opposed, uh, uh, is, is a clear no to the EU Mercosur in Austria, and it's it's especially the farmers that they would try to interlink, and then within the kind of ÖVP, they have a very strong agricultural wing. And that's, of course, then where those interests are becoming then represented at the political level. Yeah, so ab absolutely, that, that would be for wider analysis of how are those struggles being played out within the political sphere, and where is it actually possible to ensure that a particular government then also says no. Yeah, because at the European level, the way decisions are made uh, uh, is, is also, it's not just the parliament has to agree those, those free trade agreements, but also uh, the various governments. And because the EU Mercosur, the way it is at the moment constructed as a partnership agreement that would require anonymity amongst member states, and that that's why why they they try to to focus on on getting individual countries opposed to that. And there are some some discussions at the European level that you may split the agreement to have the free trade agreement as one part and the political agreement as another, because the free trade agreement as one part could then be be passed without anonymity. Yeah, and not every national. Uh, parliament would have a say on that. Yeah, so of course, in the concrete struggles, those different levels are of 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 high importance. Uh, that's not what I focused on in research, but on a wider analysis of the struggles that would be essential. Uh, Amanda, thanks. Yeah, this is actually something I was going to ask earlier, and then I decided it was too much, but then you brought it up, so <laughs> I'm going to come back. Um, it's this thing about 
you know, the position of super exploitation, the debate around whether it's in the North or not, and whether it's kind of the default position. The guy that I like, the position that I really like is actually Adrian Valencia Sotelo from Mexico. He's done a lot of work on the auto sector there. Okay. He, was a, he was a student of uh, Marini's and he's actually got a couple of books in English as well. But his, his point in, uh, he's got a book called The Futures of Work, he identified Eastern Europe as a new periphery uh, of mm -hmm. allowing super exploitation in the, e the EU lock as well. So that leads me to the question is, do you think, well, there's two things. Do you think that the idea of the race to the bottom is useful, not just as a slogan, but as a, as a phenomenon uh, in the case studies that you looked at? But secondly, um, was there a repeat of the uh, the debate around social clauses amongst uh, trade unionists in, in Italy? The idea that uh, if you insist on labor rights of uh, core, core labor standards, um, that might prevent, um, you know, the uh, social dumping from mm -hmm. the uh, Mercosur countries. Did that pop up at all? Thanks. So thanks a lot for that. Just starting off with the latter part of your question. So social rights and workers' rights, they are mentioned yeah, by trade union as absolutely essential, but it's it's no longer along the lines that there is a belief that as long as you are, adopt the ILO uh, uh, standards, then that would be enough and everything else is fine with the free trade agreement. I, I think there's a much wider understanding now that you also need to look at the, the kind of, what kind of industrial sectors are actually highlighted in trade. Yeah. The, this kind of this notion of unequal exchange, I think that that would also be now acknowledged by by those uh, uh, trade unions wow. and the wider labor movements in in any case yeah the implications uh, for the environment and especially the the fact that there are no enforceable sanctions in these trade agreements they that there's no longer this belief that the EU trade and sustainable development chapters that that they would be enough yeah they I think that that has been that has been now accepted. And Eastern Europe as new periphery, just to, who's that author again you mentioned, Adrian? Adrian Sotelo. I can send you the book. I, I translated that, it. That, well. that would be great. Yeah, thanks Thanks a lot for that. I, I think that that's what we're experiencing in Europe. And that's why I think we will have these the kind of divisions actually also within the global north. Yeah, Because in Europe too, we, we have these peripheries emerging. And I think Italy is part of that. Greece is part of that. Portugal is. So it's not just Central and Eastern Europe, it's also the kind of Southern European countries, which were part of the sovereign debt crisis, which have been emerging as, as peripheries. And perhaps you could say even within particular countries, you have peripheries emerging and some increasing migrant workforces also in the UK or, or Germany, actually, yeah, are the peripheries emerging with, within the core. And so I think those divisions will become stronger. Yeah, but so I would be very interested if you could send me that reference. That would be great. Thank you. Well, I see Nova hands up. So if I can abuse uh, Chair's privileges and ask uh, my own question. Well, I've got two questions, actually. I've really enjoyed your talk, as I always do, Andreas, and it, it's always very systematic and clear to listen. First question relates to this idea of an expanded definition of class struggle. I accept the basic premise that we need you know that you know the struggle class struggles extend beyond the workplace that's the, you know that's accepted but is there not a mm. risk that an expanded definition of class struggle it risks lumping conflicts of various intensity into one category for example a strike a general strike very clearly a class struggle a petition on the other hand petitioning something uh, you know, if we lump those two kind of various initiatives into the category of uh, class struggle, is there not risk of over overextending, expanding the definition of class struggle too much? Second question is, uh, well, it's obviously related to my, my research and, uh, you know, to what extent does a focus on the structuring conditions of 
capitalism extend to social formations where where property relations are not strictly organized around uh, industrial capitalism, the, the direct exploitation of wage, wage labor, for example, you know, peripheral agricultural economies, campesinos, mm. uh, and all the rest of it. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Oliver. So yeah, I, quite a lot of of uh, uh, pe people would struggle with this notion of an expanded notion of class struggle, and and by by using that, do we not miss and lose more of of explanatory purchase than than what what we gain? I I would see class struggle as referring to all kinds of struggles which challenge capitalist accumulation. And so if, if you have a broad struggle against the commodification of health, for example, and in the UK, we, you can see that, well, clearly, capitalist private health providers try to encroach on the NHS to scoop up the kind of profitable profitable parts. Then, then a resistance against that, I would see as a class struggle because it contests moments of capitalist accumulation. Now, you mentioned general strike and petition, and I would see those things more as the kind of, as a matter of strategy. Yeah, and so a class struggle against healthcare commodification, I think can include strikes, which we have had in the UK, by the people who work there, support by consumer, or by, by health by patients organizations in that and that could include for example a petition yeah, that that's a matter of strategy of course when you think about class struggle refusing to offer you to give your labor that that is one key way of class struggle yeah by directly trying to block capitalism capitalist accumulation at the point of production yeah, but that doesn't mean that other strategies should not be part of the wider portfolio of class struggle strategies. And then in relation to 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 your question about Colombia, yeah, where where you have a kind of a combination of different modes of production, I, I would uh, direct you directly to Tony Tony's work on the uh, capitalist social formation, yeah, which precisely provide space for this kind of idea that, yeah, just because we think there's a capitalist social formation, that doesn't mean that everything is just around wage labor, yeah, but that, that it means that it can well include still feudalist or other forms of modes of production. However, what is crucial, what is the dominant, what is the determining mode of production? Yeah, and so Colombia, I would very clearly see as a capitalist social formation with a dominant capitalist mode of production, but there will also still be other modes which are combined in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would emphasize... Totally correct me if I represented that incorrectly. So you would emphasize the, the stress on competitive accumulation as a you know as the the key dynamic yeah depending the you know the other the various other modes yeah. yeah where where does the dynamic where does this relentless drive for outward expansion for increasing capitalist accumulation come from that comes from the dominance of the capitalist mode of production yeah mm -hmm. very good if, if... well it has been a pleasure andreas uh you know, I'm, I'm you. Sure I speak for everybody here, uh, you know, but that was a fantastic, uh, very nicely structured talk. And I'm sure other people appreciate it on YouTube as well. Uh, so thank you very much. It's uh, it's nice to be able to do your supervisor, introduce your supervisor as part of a talk with CSSGJ. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, everyone. See you next week, everybody. Cheers. See you. Bye.